Thomas Shelby has been living on borrowed time. Over six seasons of BBC's Peaky Blinders, a key aspect of the psychology of Thomas Shelby was that when he was sent to fight in the war in France, that he never really returned. When his unit was cut off from the retreat with no bullets left, he and his men accepted their fate. They accepted death, but death never came. And ever since then, he's treated everything as extra. But from this traumatizing incident blossomed a destructive mindset where Thomas believes he is still on the battlefield, not just fighting to survive, but fighting to win. They may have ran out of bullets back in France, but ever since that day, he's been armed to the teeth, ready to outsmart his enemies and stoop lower than they ever thought imaginable in order to capture more territory and power. But by the final season, Thomas Shelby is so morally corrupted that others who know him refer to him as the devil. Like a cat with nine lives, Thomas manages to cheat death again and again. But while his life is spared, his loved ones consistently pay the price for his sins. To the point that by the start of season six, he's lost his wife, his brother, and his aunt. So it seems that in order for the series Peaky Blinders to end, Thomas Shelby must die. And in a way he does, but not in the way most viewers were expecting. So let's take a closer look at the ending of the series and analyze the events that led to it to make sense of it all. The final season of Peaky Blinders tackles the theme of time, identity, and fate, and how these themes crystallize in the last moments of the finale. When it comes to time, throughout the sixth season, characters are constantly checking their watches. We can hear ticking clocks. Michael is doing time in jail, his hatred for Thomas building with each passing day, were shown several bombs with timers on them, which communicates that an explosion is coming, time is running out. Tommy is also told that he has tuberculoma and is given limited time left to live, 12 to 18 months, before he becomes totally helpless and will need to rely on others, the opposite of what his entire empire was built on, self-reliance. When it comes to identity, Thomas' sense of identity is consistently undermined. In the first episode, he attempts to shoot himself, and his wife insists that he's no longer a soldier because he didn't even check his weapon before firing. You're not even a soldier anymore, Tommy. You didn't check your weapon. Stripping Thomas of one of his key identities, a soldier. In Mick alone, he rejects whiskey as he no longer consumes alcohol since Polly died four years ago, now stating, whiskey is just fuel for the loud engines inside your head. It's quite telling that Thomas is no longer willing to consume a product he's selling. He no longer really believes in what he's doing or who he is. When his daughter Ruby passes away, Thomas believes he's being punished for his sins and vows to change for the better. But in her name, and in her memory, things will change. And whatever comes down that river from now on, we will make peaceful and honest and good and send it on down the river better than it was. In our memory, we will do this. But despite his intentions, he enacts revenge on the woman he believes put a curse on his daughter. Thomas may feel a need to change, but he's built a world around himself that won't allow him to, as if he's locked into a story about the destructive fate of a soldier. But if we look at his emotional reaction to the revenge, it doesn't make the wounds heal any faster. It only deepens them. His wife Lizzie challenges him on his false promises. What is this good that you will become? All of this makes Thomas realize that he's no longer really admired. He simply obeyed and feared. His PTSD is getting worse. His previous life fighting to survive in the tunnels in France is now bleeding into his present life as a businessman, father, and politician, so much so that it's debilitating. When he's delivered his terminal diagnosis, it pulls everything into focus. In order to build such an empire, Thomas created a persona that even he believed in, a sort of mythical character that others would talk about and fear. But he now has to evaluate who the man behind the mask really is and what legacy he's leaving behind, how he wants the world to look without him in it anymore. 
This creates more guilt about his inability to change, no longer really feeling he belongs in the life he's built for himself, visibly struggling to even pretend to sympathise with fascists. All while his daughter's chair sits in the corner of the room, reminding him of the role he's playing in the world, reminding him that his time to change is running out. He's further challenged on his identity in the penultimate episode, when Stagg questions if Tommy would beat him himself now that he's an MP, highlighting the conflict between Tommy's past and present identities as well as his public persona, and then questions why he lives this life, why he's doing all of this. You could close all this down. You could leave the sport behind. But instead, you still go around and collect them please and thank you and sorry and forgive me, Mr. Shelby. These questions deepen the existential crisis that has consumed Thomas all season. Now that he knows for a fact that death is coming, that there will be an enemy he can't defeat growing inside of him, he accepts that he's not the devil. He's just an ordinary mortal man. When he's confronted by Arthur about his diagnosis, Thomas reflects on who he's been and what value and meaning he's brought to those around him. And that will be my legacy. Instead of me, there will be money. Because for most of the people who are close to me, that is what I am. There's a quiet devastation in this scene as Thomas is trying to minimize what his life has meant in order to emotionally handle letting it go. Even going as far as to say, how long have we been dead? Suggesting he believes they've been dead inside ever since the war. After sleeping with his enemy and confessing his biggest regret is marrying her, as it means she's cursed with sharing his fate, Lizzie leaves Thomas and his son chooses to stay with her over him, as she's more of a mother to him than he's ever been a father. Again, stripping Thomas of a vital part of his character, he's no longer a soldier and he's no longer a father. He tries to set things right before he goes, using money to lure Linda back into Arthur's life to keep him stable, then wiping out his enemies, ensuring the bomb that does finally go off is not his fate, even blowing up his mansion to build multiple homes for others, now putting himself back where he began, showing us the internal change that has taken place. Thomas has learned that it's not about what you can own for yourself, but what you can build for others. That's what lives on after you're gone. The constant chase for power only left him feeling empty and hungry for more. When he discovers that the terminal diagnosis was all a lie, a ploy by Mosley, he instinctively reverts back to his old self, intending to kill the doctor who deceived him. But he pleads with him, reminding Thomas that he may not be sick with tuberculoma, but he is sick of who he used to be. Now he's reformed. For so long now, he's wanted to make these changes for Ruby, and now he risks throwing it all away. The doctor notes his journey, from the back streets to the corridors of power. You can't go back, you're a different man. The gun no longer belongs in your hand. And at that moment, just before reverting back to his old ways and stealing another life, the bell tolls, marking the 11th hour. Reminding Thomas of Armistice, how in 1918, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, peace was declared and the soldiers were sent home. He whispers to himself, peace at last, realizing that this is the moment to put his gun down, to mentally step off the battlefield and stop fighting. The war is over. When he returns to his caravan, it's been set on fire, the flames engulfing all of the items he wanted to be buried with. He's witnessing his life's belongings turn to ash, his identity vanishing before his eyes. This was the very funeral he had planned for himself. He was never meant to go any further, mirroring the same moment he experienced in France when his unit ran out of bullets and were left isolated from the retreat. As he described, everything after that was extra. And now here he is, all his responsibilities settled, most of his enemies wiped out, his identity blazing into dust. In an earlier episode, Thomas was asked when he last killed a man. He answered, Four years ago, his name was Thomas Shelby. He drank whiskey. Showing us that, in Thomas's mind, 
Change requires the belief that the old version of you is simply dead, eliminated. So this scene marks the death of Thomas Shelby. Once he believed he would die, he psychologically became mortal and chose to leave the world at peace and in order. To return to his family now would only perpetuate the destructive cycle that causes everyone around him so much pain. Just like he said to Lizzie, he fears he's cursed and doesn't want his loved ones to share his fate. So he now embarks on a new journey. He came onto our screens riding a black horse, dark like his soul, and he leaves our screens riding a white one, symbolizing a clean, fresh start. Audiences expected Thomas Shelby to die in the finale of Peaky Blinders, and in many ways he did die, but he was also reborn. So what did you think of the finale of Peaky Blinders? Were you disappointed, inspired, satisfied, or left scratching your head? And if you enjoy content like this, consider supporting me on Patreon, as it really does make a difference to how much content I can pump out, or simply like, comment, and subscribe.